You're listening to the Teach Better Talk podcast featuring expert educators eager to share progressive tactics to reach more students. Teach Better Talk is created by teachers and fueled by passion. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 122 of Teach Better Talk. I'm Ray Hewart, and as always, I'm with my authentic friend, Jeff Gargas. Authentic, I like it. Where'd that come from? Well, it was given to us from our amazing guest, but I thought that it led really well into what I wanted to talk about before we got to our interview today. Yes, and I know what it is, and I'm excited. Go ahead. What do you mean? You can like read my mind? I can. I know what you're going to talk about. That's really creepy. Get out of my head, dude. It, it, is it? Is it? Here, can you hear this? Yes, that's what it is. That was me flipping through the pages of a, a brand new book that I know we're both reading right now. That's I, know, I know. I have it. In, talk about. I totally have it in front of me, and I'm legitimately texting with the author right now. So <laughs> I'm so stoked. <laughs> this is live. This is real life, people. This is the personal and authentic book from Thomas C. Murray. Yes. And we love Tom. He wrote the forward to our book, Teach Better. He is phenomenal in so many different ways. Uh, and this was really cool. Uh, so that's really cool that that Will's word got us right here. Uh, I'm, a, I'm super stoked about that. So tell me about it, Ray. Well, it's kind of like Tom ha- was reading my mind too, because as we were finishing up this podcast recording with William, Thomas C. Murray texted me and, you know, like thanked me because I'd posted on social media that I'm reading his book, obviously, because it's just brand new out. And I am so excited to dive into it. And so it just was so fitting that then we started recording this intro. And I'm like, hey, Jeff, let's talk about this awesome book that I know we're both reading. (laughs) Yes, I love it. So yeah, so it's personal and authentic designing learning experiences that impact a lifetime. And the book is is great. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm only a little ways into it, but um, we, you we were. I know that you love the cover. I do. It's. I think your words were pretty. It is pretty. I'm not kidding. It's this book really is cool. very it's well very designed. Cool. Yes, really well designed. I think another piece that I really love, and I know that you did as well, Ray, is is all the the work and thought that Tom put into the resources that that accompany the book. Uh, which I think is really, really cool and really, really valuable. Valuable. Can you talk about those for a minute? Absolutely. Um, there are so many tactical takeaways that I've already been looking at through this book. One of the few features, I mean, there's so many in here. There's a ton of graphics that I think are super easy to understand. I love this edition of the Make It Stick post-it that is you found throughout each chapter that are stories um, shared by other teachers or principals around the country. I just think that he does a great job not only sharing the story of how to be personal and authentic in education, but also, you know, by amplifying the stories of others and sharing not just the overarching philosophies, but the actual pieces Mm -hmm. you can go and take into your school building tomorrow to actually make it personal and authentic. And then what I love is he's also got he's got an accompanying web website. So you get the book and you can get this website that he's got that that gives you stop and reflect and like study guide questions. And he's got these uh, stop and reflect cards and the hashtag authentic edu call outs, uh, which is just like all the like call out quotes from each chapter. And he breaks down each chapter. And then he's got like uh, videos that make sense that are not, not created just for the book, but are have been created from himself or other people that connect to the book and connect to each chapter. Like it's, it's a really cool uh, resource for like really diving in even deeper into the, the book and really pulling as much as you can out. And then I don't know if you saw, but like he's got the personal and authentic poster as well. Yeah, can I just say I'm a fan of this book, absolutely. But you guys have to go look at this website because there are so many like cute downloads that I am going to put all over my classroom. <laughs> really, I think I'm gonna buy. I think I'm gonna buy the the poster. I think I think I'm gonna get the poster. Are are I'll you offering me. to buy me one too, Jeff? Yeah, I, it's done. Considering done, we're gonna get it done. We're gonna, we're gonna yes. decorate the walls. Every everything's gonna look more just a little bit nicer. Here but I don't need a sticker because I have one right here, and I oh, already I am putting it in a very special spot. Yes, my sticker is about to go on the back of, uh, of my of my laptop. So, so just a, uh, we want to do this. Just super. We actually have Tom coming on. Um, 
in one of the next couple episodes he's going to be on. So you're going to get to hear Tom. Tom was one of the very first ones we ever had on our podcast um, very, very early on and was fantastic. He told one of the failure stories that I think you and I probably referenced more than almost any. It was also included in our book. Um, and such a fantastic episode. So we're super excited to have him come back on. We're doing that episode with him very, very much just based all around the book. So we're really going to dive into his mind of where the book came from, why he wrote it, what he wants you to get out of it. We're going to hear it right from him. Uh, so super excited about that. So make sure you go out and get the book personal, personal and authentic. Uh, it's, it's on Amazon and everywhere else or, or Thomas C. Murray. Uh, dot com as well and then make sure you check out uh, keep listening to to teach better talk subscribe so you don't miss that episode when we bring tom back on so super super excited about that ray absolutely and william did a great job in his episode so are you ready to get to that job yeah, so talking about what, uh, what we were talking with William Illingworth, and Williams, he comes from a, a cool uh, viewpoint because he's in higher education. Uh, so he's a, he was an instructional technologist, now he's an instructional designer, and he kind of explains what that is. But he gets to support uh, educators at the higher education level, which is really really cool. Um, I think it's really neat that he, he his first job he actually was able to do uh, at the same institution that he got his undergraduate at, and he shares that story and gets into sort of the the nitty gritty of how he tries to best support his teachers so that they can best support their students um, in, in, in that level. And some really cool stuff. I, I think the thing that I love most about Will is he's a tech guy. So a lot of what he does, a lot of his background is tech, but a lot of what he talks about isn't necessarily tech. It's the it's all the other things that are important to have that make tech more effective. And he talks about the, the, having the hard discussions and, and conversations with people. He shares a, a cool failure and how he came back from that. And when he lays out his be, his piece of advice, I think uh, you just get your tissues ready. It's a fantastic story that will pull at your heartstrings. So I'm super excited to get into it. Ray, uh, any last words or just go? No, let's do this, man. All right, episode 122 with William Illingworth. Hey, what's up? It's Jeff. Don't worry, we're going to get right back to the episode, but I really want to check out and make sure that you are connected with us on social media. Ray and I and the entire Teach Better team want to connect with you. We want to hear your stories. We want to be a part of your journey. We want to be there to support you in any way we can, and we want to learn and grow with you. So please connect with us. Everything we have is at Teach Better Team. And then, of course, make sure you connect with me at Jeff Gargas and Ray at Ray Hewitt. Let's get back to the episode. All right, we are here. We are talking with William Ellingworth. And William, it is super awesome to have you on. You and I were able to connect. I don't even know how long ago that was now. We connected on Twitter for a while. Then we reached out. We're like, hey, let's let's chat. We connected on a Google Hangout. And we had a good time just chatting, just kind of learning about you know each other's roles in education and stuff like that. And I thought, hey, you need to come on this podcast. It just took us a long while to figure out when the schedules would work. So <laughs> really glad to have you on right now, man. How are you feeling right now? Pretty good. You know, it's been, uh, I'm a, I'm full-time higher education. So we're coming up on the end of the semester and that's, uh, you know, it's been a big sprint to get here, but things are starting to wind down a little bit, you know? That's a big, big deal for like ending the semester strong with your, with everything going on at this college level. Yeah. And I, I, I've done a little bit of work here and there with uh, K-12 teachers and colleagues. And, and I know that there's something about uh, that space where it's, it's really the marathon. You're going year round and you got to think a whole lot differently. So when we have our little semesters, I feel like, I feel like I, I'm, I'm cheating almost, you know, it's a bit <laughs> easier than the rest. Well, William, I'm excited to dive into kind of all that you're doing and you transition us perfectly to our first question. I really just want you to share about all that you do. And I know that for a lot of people that can be really a, a very weighted question, but tell us like, what do you do in education? What does your day to day look like? Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm an instructional designer. So that's really, um, in some ways, the catch all term for everything uh, that I can do to support a faculty member. Um, You know, I worked first as an instructional technologist. And where I would make the difference is that focused explicitly on using technology in the classroom and using it well. Uh, Transitioning into the instructional designer space brings out a little bit more. So I work with faculty to uh, design and lay out entire online courses. Um, I work with them to do kind of that instructional tech stuff. I also support them with like reviewing their midterm evaluations and determining if there's any kind of methods they want to change or content areas they want to change in their classrooms. 
um, in many ways, I'm kind of like a third party reflection point, you know? It's awesome. I really like that. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's a, it's a unique role, uh, I think in a, in a, a really, I could imagine the, the day to day is never the same when you're supporting faculty and trying to work because because you're not only working with individual people all the time, but also then they're they're also working with and supporting individual students and individual things. So that all comes back. Your day to day has got to be just always changing, uh, which leads me into my second, qu- which leads into the second question. I think really well because that that's what leads to a lot of this stuff, a lot of craziness in your life. But you also you've had a a, a, a good career, a couple different positions. Uh, different experiences at a couple different uh, institutions. So, uh, hoping that you can share with us a time that you've had a failure in your career. Kind of take us there with you. What happened? How to make you feel? How did you overcome that? And then what did you take away from that experience? Yeah. So, uh, at my last institution, as that instructional technologist role, um, I was responsible for so many different learning systems. Uh, whether it was course evaluations or you know lecture capture in the classroom, there's a, just a lot going on the, the learning management system. Um, and one of the, my big opportunities for success was in revising that course evaluation process. In fact, when I came to my institution as a student, I said uh, I mentioned before to you guys, I was there as an undergrad and got to work there afterwards. We were doing paper evaluations, and by the time I ended up leaving that institution, we had gone through six different methods of evaluating faculty, <laughs> uh, including Google Forms, including some you know homegrown things, and then vendors. So the last one I was working on before leaving, uh, I was setting up this big transition from vendor to vendor. Um, the one vendor had been meeting our needs, but this next vendor was just going to go beyond, above and beyond. And I did a full evaluation and I got the committee's support and gung-ho. Um, I don't think we even made it 360 days before I had done the full transition back to the last vendor. I mean, we got into this new one. There were so many features. There was, so much, there was a week-long training. There was just everything. And uh, the faculty adoption failed. I couldn't figure a couple things out. The reports weren't working right. And uh, one of the critical things in higher ed course evaluations is they have to be anonymous. And the anonymous feature was broken for three months and I didn't even know it. Uh, So you kind of pull all of that together. And it was just a big humble pie moment when I was just had to go to my my boss and back to that committee and be like, hey, uh, I think my best suggestion is to roll back, go back with our last vendor. It won't be a price problem. Uh, and that'll give us some time to kind of reevaluate and get going again. And and uh, it was handled pretty well. People didn't people didn't chastise me, but uh, it was definitely a moment to say, man, it's even the shiny thing is not always the best thing, you know. So I was gonna say, so so is that kind of what you took away from that? Is that hey, just the big shiny uh, thing that appears to be the best may not always be the best, and, and to evaluate that differently. Like, would you have? Looking back, do you think you could have evaluated differently or was it just going to be a, we had to test it out to see if it wasn't the right fit? You know, if I did it twice, um, I, I think the product could have worked out. They really did have the right references and, and the folks I talked to were using it well. Um, but there's just something about my implementation. So maybe I didn't take enough time to kind of dig into the, the research and stu- such, but the other thing that kind of was a, a catch-22 on this was they gave us a great deal, and that made it really easy to decide to go with them. Sure. But then everything else they did cost something. Mm. So we didn't reach out for extra support. I didn't go for the face-to-face training. I, you know, There's a couple things like that we didn't do. They actually would have set up the first report entirely themselves – and then taking the responsibility for it, you know, the an- anonymous feature breaking, for instance, uh, except that would have cost another like five or six thousand dollars just to have them set that report up. So, you know, I, I think maybe cheap is not always the best answer. So I got to know how long did it. So it, it sounds like you go, you went back to the previous one. How long did that take to roll back and go back to the other one? This is just more oh, curiosity. Spark yeah. <laughs> so it was actually really great that um, in that case, I had well-established relationships internally and externally. Mm-hmm. Uh, the old vendor had been really a supportive vendor. It wasn't any issue that I left them for. It was just that this new one provided so much more. Uh, and so when I reached back out to them, they said, William, no problem. We're excited to have you back. Let me check with our data guys. We have all your connections in place. You confirm with your people you have what you have, 
you know, make all your connections on your side, we'll be able to turn on tomorrow. Um, and I, I don't want to say it was 24 hours, but within the week, we were back up with that product because my people internally had kept all the connections they needed as well. Well, I'm glad it didn't take forever. That, that's really quick turnaround. So that's good. All right. So yeah. now let's, let's, let's flip it around now. Let's talk about a successful moment you've had. And this can be something big or something small, but tell us what happened. Why was it a success for you? And what did you take away from that experience? Yeah, cool. So, um, this is going to trend, uh, transition from my instructional technology to design space. Uh, my last institution, while I was still a technologist, um, I got word of a faculty member duo that was teaching a class together. Now, it was a smaller institution, so classes very rarely got over 30 students. And, you know, big, university, big universities will have two, 300 students in some classes. So it was a little tricky for us to imagine at that place how to work with 80 students in one room. Because that's what they were doing. They were bringing two classes of 40 together. While I attended the classroom, I saw this uh, big issue with engagement happening where, you know, the, the faculty put out this really critical question, something I knew the students could really wrestle with if they opened it up. And out of 80 students, two hands would go up. Um, and, you know, somebody's on eBay, somebody's on Photoshop, somebody else on Facebook. And I was just like, wow, this engagement's really not here. So that kind of got me on this quest to find a tool or a method that could improve engagement in larger classrooms, smaller classrooms. And just this past year coming to my new institution, I had a faculty member raise the same question. And I had been looking into uh, the tool Nearpod. I don't know if you're familiar, but it's an interactive presentation software. And it allows the students to sign in and see their slides on their personal devices. Well, this really was would have been fantastic for that 80 student classroom. But as a success point for what I'm working with, uh, one faculty member started to adopt it and try it out. And that's rolled forwards into a year and a half pilot with the product encompassing some 20, 22 folks uh, who are trying it and everything from just like simple seminars to uh, all three of their classes, you know, five to six sessions a week. Um, we've started totaling something like thousands of interactions a month uh, whereas what I had maybe imagined was a couple of adopters and some, you know, hundreds of engagements, um, it's really blown itself out of the water. And I know for me, it's it's really encouraging to see something that I was invested in and that I kind of wanted to support gain some life. But most importantly is the impact on the students. Um, I'm having faculty come to me and say, yeah, this is great. The students can engage. They can take a quiz. They can take a poll. They can do a video, you know, while getting all their slides in one spot. But uh, they're also, we have a lot of international students and it's easier for them to translate language. You know, it's easier for them to switch from their slides on their own device, to translate apps and kind of get what they need out of the situation. Some of the other folks are like, uh, you know, students with sight issues who maybe need to sit in the front row to see that slide projector. Instead, they can sit wherever they want to because the uh, the content's right there on the device in front of them. And this isn't just me or my insights. Like the faculty are bringing this info to me saying, Will, this is working. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's great. It's encouraging. But the, the, the impact is zoomed there with the students knowing that they're able to learn uh, in a more engaging context with more options and opportunities for their situations. And that's really yeah. what, it, what it all comes down to, right, Ray? Is I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but it's, it's, it's focusing on students. But I also want to give a shout out to Nearpod because we do know them, Will. They were actually one of the sponsors of the first ever Teach Better conference. Uh, oh, wow. Not too long ago, they provided our Wi-Fi. They, they hooked everyone up that attended with an upgrade to their accounts, plus a whole bunch of freebies and, and goodies and stuff. Oh, wow. So huge, huge shout out to Nearpod. Apparently, Will <laughs> likes them as well. So that's good. Well, I think, Will, your focus on wanting to engage students more effectively with their learning is fantastic. I think that being your mission, especially at the higher ed level, is so necessary. So that's such a fantastic success. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a little bit of my background, too. I, I remember graduating um, and, and as an undergrad, for instance, and coming out of uh, walking on Friday and, and being a new man on Saturday, right? I'm, I'm all out. I'm graduating. What do I do now? And I thought to myself, what, what do I know? What, what do I remember of my undergraduate? And I was really stumped and I couldn't really pull the theories out that I wanted or the practices I had been taught or the, the info I should have remembered. And I thought to myself, you know what, I want to commit to being a part of changing that for other students so that 
there aren't others like me who feel like they've missed something in their graduate or undergraduate degree. Uh, and so I got into the process, uh, you know, I like to tell people, I, I teach teachers how to teach with technology. That's a simple phrase for it, but it's really about trying to help teachers engage with learners in a new way. And so if that's a technology or a method, that's what I'm here to do. Well, William, I can only assume that you're going to tell me that the answer to this next question is related to technology, but what's getting you excited about education right now and all that you're doing? Ooh, I get, I get the kind of the jitters, you know, this is an exciting one because it's so important in what we're even dealing with in society and culture. Uh, to me, discourse is a practice that is being forgotten. I think we need to improve the opportunities for discourse and the ability to discourse, uh, the awareness of it, right? How, how many, uh, how many times have you heard in your own, your families and friends, you know, at the holiday dinner table, don't talk about faith, you know, religion, politics, specific things, because nobody wants to engage or get in the nitty gritty or, or have an awkward moment over those things. And I think that actually rhetoric and discourse are key to engaging with that. Um, you know, I, I, I see so much in my social media spheres where folks are not having conversations, but throwing thoughts out there and not listening to one another, but hurting each other. And, and these are all folks who are trying to get to the same thing, improving teaching and learning. Um, now, are there tech tools that are getting involved with that? I definitely think there are. Um, one thing that I'd, somebody I'd love to plug, and I hadn't thought of this before, but uh, Equity Maps is this app on the, uh, the Apple products that is actually designed to help you um, evaluate during a conversation, maybe even like a classroom discussion, the equity of uh, participants in the room. How many people are speaking? How often are they speaking? And do they speak across one another? So there's a little setup. You have to like map each student out and then the professor and any other participants. And, and then you kind of have to keep on top of who's talking. You have to tell the app, you know, A is talking, B is talking, A talk to C, C talk to D, D talk to A again. Uh, but as you do that, it builds out this beautiful map on the other side and shows you, is there equity in the conversation happening in your, in your, in your classroom? That's just one, but, uh, you know, there's so much in this space. It's uh, a big discussion point for me with peers. It's something that I try and advocate for with the faculty. You know, we have so many online courses where the forums, for instance, are just post one thing by uh, Wednesday and make sure you have two replies by Sunday. And, and the forum is supposed to assume this role for discourse, but is that happening? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know that it isn't, but I don't think that that mold that we're all trying to fit things into is the one that's really cultivating discourse and giving us the opportunity to talk to one another, to listen to one another, to engage hard topics. And this is, you know, where I'm feeling things, what I'm seeing in some of my peers, what I'm seeing in some of my faculty. But uh, when I talk with my K-12 uh, colleagues, they're all talking about like the social emotional uh, learning, the SEL curricula that are being worked on right now across the board. And I think that this is critical in that space. You know, if we can't learn to talk with one another, <laughs> what are we doing? Absolutely. The collaboration is so essential. Now, I know, William, you're going to want to go a tech route for this. I just can, I can predict that you have amazing advice for technology. But I really want to challenge you here to step out of the box and really think about all the work that you continue to do with teachers. And as I'm asking about like one piece of advice, if you can try and think of one, one piece of advice that you would give to a new educator or maybe just an educator going through a transition or just striving to engage their students better, to interact more effectively with technology. What is the one piece of advice that teachers need? That's, that's so hard. And, and I think we're in such a world of like that sound bite kind of uh, engagement that I don't want it to be sound trite. Uh, but to me, yeah, Ray, it really isn't even about tech. It's about us. It's at that egocentric level, not in a negative way, but we need to reflect. Um, we need to take time, slow down, and uh, find a spot to think about what we're doing. I mentioned before I got into my field because of a moment of introspection. You know, I was really thinking about what I wanted to do with the rest of my life in a sense. And I said, okay. Let's think about issues I've experienced and ways that teachers did well and ways that di teachers didn't do well. And how can I now become a participant in that? 
So I think that if our faculty in higher ed and teachers in K-12, you know, I know it's so tough to find time and find space. Um, you know, my faculty have issues with email and they're on committees and administrative stuff. And I know in the K-12 colleagues, a lot of them are talking to me about, you know, how many different curriculum they pretty much have to make to meet all the IEPs and different things like that that are going on. But, you know, if you can take a moment to reflect on a discussion that just flopped uh, or on an exam you just wrote or on the conversation you just overheard from students in the back, like if you take that moment as quick as you can to think, why did it flop? Is this exam good? Why did the students say what they just did? Or what's the importance of what they just said for what I can maybe engage them in a more a communal sense in the classroom? I think when you take time to consider it and work it over, you know, you're, you're poised, to, poised to figure it out with excellence. And that to me is it. I want to improve teaching and learning so that all of it can be excellent. That is uh, some really great advice. I'm really glad that you went that way. Uh, yeah, that reflection is so important. And I love how you say just to step back and whether it's a discussion that flopped or an exam that you're writing or that conversation you overheard, but to like, really take the time to reflect on it, to listen to like, why are those things happening? Why did it flop? Mm-hmm. What am I writing this for? What was the conversation about? Do that so then you could approach it differently. I, I That was fantastic. <laughs> Just great so far. I'm super excited for number for, for this next set here. So right. well, what we're going to do here is we're going to go through the next six questions. Your goal is to answer each one in 15 seconds or less. You ready to go? <sighs> All right, gotta get those, <laughs> gotta get those yeah, dinners out. <laughs> breath out, it. shake, shake the hands out a little bit. If you gotta get up and stretch, now's the time to do it. Uh, all right, so here we go. Let's do it. What is one ed tech tool you cannot live without? Oh man, I, so I've thought about this time and time again, and honestly, it's trite. It is. It's cliche. Google. Ironically, from Google Suite and the products that are in it, but just to googling things, you need it. I'm, I'm with you. Uh, give us one book that you're reading right now. Uh, you know, I'm just into novels. So uh, my audio book is The Map Maker's Apprentice. It's book two in a trilogy, and I'm loving it. It's taking me into period piece for, uh, you know, turn of the century in London. Awesome. Who do we need to follow on Twitter today? At Irv Spanish for gamification slash game-based learning. Great guy. Irv's a great guy. Um, also, Lang on Course. Um, he's a higher ed guy. For, he's just into insightful education principles and methods. Um, and you kind of, I was thinking through maybe a third person, but I'm really going to point you at a, a chat itself. Um, the hashtag Schoology chat is a great place to re- meet the rest of my edge of Twitter friends. Um, it's, it's a really good group. Awesome. And what's a good, uh, either YouTube channel or website for educators? You're gonna think that this is pretty lame. Uh, my librarian <laughs> friends are going to love me, <laughs> but the library, I'm, I'm really into reading scholarly journals and things like that. So, um, you know, while the YouTube channels are great and I love the content that's going out there, I take a lot of time to get into the methods that are in my library. So make sure you connect with your alma mater because you likely have uh, free access to somebody's library somewhere online. Very cool. Give us a daily, weekly, or monthly routine every teacher should get into. I did this when I got into my next or my current job, uh, and I, it's it's really been impactful for me. Take notes at everything. Um, I take notes on each meeting I have, and then if I have action items, I need to send an email on each one. I need to count my hours with each one. I have a checkbox with each set of notes so that I make sure I do all those kinds of follow ups. So really dig in. And what is the best piece of of advice you've ever received? Uh, well, this is, this is uh, near and dear to my heart. So my dad uh, went through stage four colon cancer and he lost his battle that process. Uh, but throughout every single day of it, he would write blogs and engage with his family and everyone. And he'd sign every single one of them with celebrate everything. So in the midst of the hard times, I hope you too can celebrate everything. Wow. Oh, that was a heck of a finish. Yeah, that was a <laughs> strong, you get a trophy. I was going to say, get the trophy ready, right? <laughs> well, and you the teach, teach Better Talk trophy right there. I love that. I'll, I will del- I'll hand deliver it. He's not that far away from me. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll go across the board and we'll get that done. Oh, yeah. We don't, we don't give that, that trophy out lightly, William. We're, we're going to make sure you get, a cop- you get your copy of that. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. Ho- hopefully that's just a, an impactful thing for everybody too because it – I, I think it I think it will be. That is that is really great. Um can't forget great it. Great advice in general, but the way I mean the story you share with it is fantastic. So 
Awesome. So, William, I think I have the most important um, question of the night. And I always think this is most important because we hope for this podcast to just be the beginning of hundreds and thousands of more conversations that our guests are able to have with the amazing Teach Better Talk listeners. So would you mind kind of sharing how our listeners can get connected with you and continue the conversation? Definitely. Thank you, Ray. Um Twitter is my number one. So if you want to find me at Willingworthy, I know that uh, Jeff and Ray will make sure that's in text so you can figure it out. Um, I'm also opening up a website trying to get into some consulting and side work with design, right? So that's uh, a lot of fun. That's willingworthy.com. Um, that's also just another contact point to get to me and uh, LinkedIn, William Illingworth. Uh, if you get in touch with me through any of those means, I'm glad to continue conversations like this. This is where that came out of, uh, but also you know, if you have something going on with discourse or um, you want to talk about my story on Celebrate Everything, glad to connect. And, you know, you can find all the links and all the resources and everything we talked about in this episode over at teachbetter.com as well as those important links uh, for connecting with William and continuing the conversation. So head over to teachbetter.com for all of that. Be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. And if you can give us a rating and a review, we'd really appreciate that as well. And let's continue to take this one step further. Think of just three of your colleagues who need to hear these amazing stories and share this podcast with them. Well, man, this was fantastic. I'm so glad that we uh, we took the time to connect earlier in the year and jumped on a hangout and were able to chat and that you were able to find the time. We were able to match up schedules and get you onto this. Uh, it was just a great uh, episode. So much value here. So excited for everyone to hear and, and listen to it and then connect with you and continue that conversation. Man, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you as well. And and I'll take take this a second to tell everybody, you know, you always need an opportunity. Just answer, you know, somebody's going to show up. I love it. Until next time, let's get out there and let's teach better. Oh my God, you're a huge failure. You suck. <laughs>